Thank you, John. I have a quick childhood story I wanted to start this evening off with that I do believe is relevant. So I grew up in Westchester County and my parents fostered my love of nature in two different ways. The first is the freedom to explore. We had a little brook that meandered through my backyard and I would spend hours in that brook upending rocks and looking at moss. Second thing is our field trips. They would gather the neighborhood kids, pile them in the station wagon. And one trip that I really will never forget is the day we cleaned the sideline of the Sawmill River Parkway. There were about six kids, they gave us each a bag. We walked along the sh shoulder, cleaned, sorted our rubbish and actually visited one of the first recycling centers in the area. I share that story because I bet all of us have such a story like that. So yes, we are the education committee and we're working closely with teachers, but we all are helping to foster young children to become future river keepers. Teachers, parents, grandparents, siblings. So think about that story as we take our venture today through the education program. And Lauren will speak next about the um, impact of the pandemic. Thanks, Kendall. Um, uh, our year started very similarly to everyone else's. So um, we went from sort of being in a normal environment to suddenly having schools closed and trying to navigate hybrid plans, what those were, what they meant. Um, and we went from being able to have field trips and have our on the water program and be in the classrooms to suddenly having all field trips canceled. So we really went from things like what you see in the image below where students are out on the water, maybe experiencing their first time out on the water, they get to go to biological stations and they get to really experience what it's like to be out there. And then suddenly we were in this world where it was much more like the picture above where the desks were spaced apart and um, everybody has their own container that they're working out of. And that is absolutely the way that we should be handling the pandemic, but it does make it very different for educators. And then we also had some transitions happen at Save the River. So Patricia Schulenberg, who was in my position beforehand, um, she got this really great opportunity and moved on. And she left this wonderful framework that whoever was going to come on next would be able to just pick up the pieces and keep moving the program forward. So I joined in August and was able to just pick that up and with the help of the education committee, move it forward. To talk about how Save the River responded to the pandemic, I'm gonna pass it back over to Heather so that she can talk about that. Thank you, Lauren. Well, we very quickly identified the need for online programming. Um, I still work part-time for Watertown City Schools and late in March, I th really think most of New York State was learning remotely. So I was busy during the day helping to design activities for three, four and five-year-olds for their teachers to deliver to children that were at home learning either through Zoom, Seesaw or other platforms. In any event, we thought it was important to not just read a story and have a conversation, but to come up with activities. And I took that mindset back to the education committee. We began with the idea of virtual field trips as a way for children to feel like they were on a field trip while the actual field trips were on pause. We thought about the resources that are available for teachers 
and how we wanted to hone in on that. And more specifically, there are many people being teachers now. The children weren't going off to school. Many parents were juggling work at home, their child learning remotely, um, an older sibling becoming the teacher, mom and dad. So we were very careful in our design to make sure that it's user friendly. You don't have to be an educator with an education degree in a classroom to benefit from our online programming. And then we thought about the new styles needed for teaching. If you focus at the two pictures in the bottom of our screen, Lauren had touched upon the children out at the biological station. Look at them all hovering over the same tank, shoulder to shoulder, no masks, working together. Now, look at the next picture. If you look really closely behind the children, blue with a red top, is the class water table where children would experience water shoulder to shoulder, hands dipped in together. Well, this teacher really was creative. This three-year-old class is doing a study on water. The children are social distanced. The children are wearing masks, but the children each have their own container of water and materials. They're still having the exploration opportunity. So my visits in classrooms in Watertown was helping me to come up with some of our activities with the education um, committee. Updating the education page. We met as a committee, came up with many of our ideas, but I would re be remiss if I didn't note that it's Lauren and Lindsay at Save the River that take the information from us, from old people like me that might not be so savvy with technology and put it all together on the website, make it in a format that's user-friendly for educators and families alike. So kudos to them for that effort. Our next thought was, how do we get the word out? So much of our field trip popularity really comes word of mouth when we're on field trips. Well, we didn't have that opportunity this year. So I crafted a letter and ran it by the superintendent of schools for Watertown, Patty Labar. Within a couple hours, she responded to my letter, said this is an excellent way to approach it, disseminated the letter out to all of the principals, and it went from there to teachers. That was a very important protocol we felt we needed to follow during a confusing time with so much information coming at superintendents and teachers. Lauren took that um, framework and ran with it. And we have many school districts that have already responded and have shared this information with their teachers. Lauren's now going to talk a little bit about where we are now. Thanks, Heather. So if you were to go online right now and navigate to savetheriver.org and click on our education tab, there are four lessons that you would find right now. So they're broken into two components. We've got virtual field trips, which really, they seek to make it feel like you're there at these locations. And then we have story time, which is geared sometimes toward younger audiences, sometimes toward older audiences. Um, and on those, you, there's, there are different links, there are different activities that are all associated with these programs. And through these programs, and also through a couple of programs that snuck in before the pandemic um, closed everything down, the Save the River educated about 500 students in 2020, which is fantastic. So just, just through these four programs, we've really been making an impact. And uh, Heather was speaking about where we are now and reaching out to superintendents, but what's happening next? Like in the next month or so, what do we envision happening? So there are three new stories coming up in story time for younger readers. 
and they feature local author Hope Irving Marston's My Little Book series. So those will explore wood ducks, otters, and painted turtles. And in the story times, you get to read along with one of the volunteers. And then the other thing that's coming up is the Freshwater Mussels booklet. So this is Our Mighty River Keepers, the Freshwater Mussels. This is geared toward age six. Um, it's part of the New York State DEC Invasive Species Grant that Save the River was awarded. We're partnering with St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division and New York State Museum. And if you caught Jessica's talk on Saturday, she talked more about the science end of what's going on with this with this project, um, but this is uh, getting the word out about these freshwater mussels. And one of the ways that we can do that is to get it to kids and let them explore this. So what's next after that? Well, we reached out to superintendents and some of the teachers have responded to us. So the next step is to take that and reach back out to those teachers and learn what it is that they want to talk about what their classes are interested in and start that conversation with them. We have new programs in development. Uh, one of them is experiencing what happens under the ice. So we are all pretty familiar with the river during the summertime. Um, you know, you get to go out on a boat, you get to go to the beach. There are different ways of experiencing the river, but the, the river doesn't go to sleep in the wintertime. Um, so we want to look at what happens under the ice. What do the fish do? Where do the turtles go? Things like that and really experience the river in all of its seasons. And then another program that we've got in development is to take the Junior Riverkeeper program, which has been so successful for us, and move it into a platform where it can be those, those programs and those young advocates can reach us through Skype or Zoom. Um, so those updates are all coming in the future. And then um, with each program, there are a set of uh, components that come with it. So I'm going to transfer it back over to Heather so that she can talk a bit about what you can expect when you get one of these packets that um, introduces you to a topic on the river. Heather? Yeah. Thanks, Lauren. First, I need to thank the Education Committee. Lauren and I are sharing our current work with you, but next to us, behind us, together with us is a fantastic committee of educators that are passionate, no matter what age group they represent, about all the different ways to learn along the river. So thank you to all of the teachers on the Education Committee. And I need to mention one in particular, Janet Burroughs. She took that story about a little muscle I don't think I knew a lot about earlier and her passion for this freshwater muscle and its importance to our river habitat really made her whole story time segment come alive. You do not need to be a child to appreciate her story. So check it, check it out in the next couple of days, Russell the Muscle. Each of our programs, if you were to click on the education guide, oh, there, sorry. Am I with you now? Yep. <laughs> okay. Each of our program guides starts with a prompt a video or an activity. And we think a real experience is very important to get a child excited or learning. For example, when I'm reading um, the story about the river otter, I'm down along a river bank and you can hear the water and you can see the birds in the background. So the opening prompt is very important. Each educator's guide is organized in a way that every time you hit a tab for a specific guide, it follows the same framework. And that framework includes um, additional links and information. 
Importantly, it includes a vocabulary list. So you can be enjoying a story time and there'll be a vocabulary list that will reach anywhere from a three-year-old up to a third grader. So it's rigorous vocabulary, no matter what grade level you are at. Each guide includes additional activities. And these additional activities um, are used either before or after your experience. And they're focused to deepen the child's learning. We also think it's important that the materials we offer can work for a teacher in a classroom or a learner at home. Inexpensive household items. For example, after a child listens to Haas the Great Blue Heron, they're challenged to design a nest, build a nest, and then for the older child, do some engineering and test how strong their nest is. Some of the materials that are suggested are to begin with a coffee filter. Household items, yard items, build your nest, and then use small stones or pennies to check the durability of your nest, the weight and what it can handle. Most of our activities are created with STEAM in mind science, technology, engineering, art, and or math. The activities are listed beginning with the three-year-old on up through third grade or for the upper end, fourth through sixth grade. The activities are also New York State standard aligned. That's really important to be valid for a teacher to take the time to click on Save the River and use our website offerings. We need to keep in mind that anytime a teacher takes a field trip, they fill out the form to book the bus, to use the money to take a child away from school, right on that form, they need to confirm the New York State standards that that field trip will cover. We use the same thought process for any time a teacher takes time on our website to do our experiences with students, they can list the New York State standards that that experience will cover. All of these are listed chronologically in age area, pardon me, age order. So if I'm a second grade teacher and I have a writing standard that I need to hit. And one of the writing standards is the child being able to share information after a non-fiction literature experience. Well, that could be Haas the Great Blue Heron. They can put right in their lessons to their principal. We experienced Haas the Great Blue Heron. The children did a follow-up writing activity sharing the real information that they learned from Haas. So that alignment for teachers is really, really important for them to be able to take the time. So we tried to make it um, easy and comfortable for teachers, for families, grandparents, whoever the educator is in the moment um, during this kind of unusual time. Um, thank you for listening. And I think Lauren's going to wrap it up for us. Thanks Heather. So thank you for spending your Wednesday evening with us. We appreciate it. Um, if you are interested in helping out, if you're interested in being part of this, please get in touch with us. Uh, if you want to train the next generation of junior river keepers and our, our young advocates, reach out. And also if you are an educator, um, whether you are a formal teacher or if you're just teaching at home and you have a topic that you're interested in focusing on or your students are interested in focusing on, please reach out to us. So the contact information is up here. Um, you can either call us by phone or send us an email. And then with that, I'm going to switch hats and move more into the moderator position and start the question period. So on the bottom of your screens, there is um, a 
Q&A component. If you click on that, you can type in your questions and Heather and I will try to answer those. Um, the first one up, um, Heather, there's a question that maybe you could address and it's why are the vocabulary lists important? Thank you. Vocabulary lists are important to remind teachers all the different ways a book can enrich the child's learning. It helps the teacher to formulate their lesson plan, um, having the vocabulary first. If I was going to do a story in class, the night before I would bring that book home, I'd probably check in on the Save the River website. I would review that vocabulary. I would know what words, say for a four-year-old might be difficult and I would put it in their ear before I begin the story. Or for some areas, you wanna build background knowledge with a conversation before you begin the book. So the, the vocabulary helps you to build that. Thanks. Um, the next one I think I can address, it's um, somebody is interested in training. So. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us, just use the email address here. It's info at savetheriver.org, and that will be the easiest way to get in, get in touch with us. Uh, okay, the next question is, um, I think either one of us could answer it, Heather. It's, who developed the content and how much does it cost? The education committee developed the content together. We are a team <laughs> and different uh, members, depending on what grade level you might represent, come up with ideas. Save the River also generates some great ideas. And how much does it cost? It doesn't cost anything to visit our webpage and to participate in our online learning. 